education that though yet is the goal of the organization of the school. So if it's crap, he's the one to complain to, not me. <laughs> I was about to thank some other people for their help in organizing. Just in case they're not on these things. Yes. Anyway. Um, Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to the Deputy Quantum Algebra and MVQC. Right. Hello. So I have to say some thanks for uh, Jim and Chris for explaining us some category theory in the last two days. I suppose um, some of you might be wondering what all that was for. So I hope that in this talk you'll get to see it used for something to do with quantum computing. Okay, so I like to put this slide in all my talks. <laughs> so when we think about um, computing, we know that underneath our, our computer systems there are these, um, these intricate low-level systems that are trying circuits, by numbers, all these kinds of things. And we put one of you with some higher level, more abstract structure that captures the, the, the structure of the act of computing rather than the, the engineering of the physical devices doing that. And we think about um, quantum mechanics, there's all this complicated mathematical gadgetry, and there's not such an obvious it's not so obvious what should go in this, in this space here to see what's the abstract account of what's happening in quantum computation. And so in this talk, I'm going to claim that red and green dots are the answer. So um, in Richard Joseph's talk, he said quite a lot of things that he said were responsible for the power of quantum computation. Um, so I'm going to give my own version of that. So if you read uh, a textbook, you can see this is a fairly typical design pattern for quantum computation. Take some Buffer, some buffer of zeros, the Fourier transform and then you apply the sum of the function. And then you get, in the middle here, you get the superposition of every possible bit string. And this leads some people, like this newspaper for example, to say that the power of quantum computation comes from superposition. Right? But this is a silly idea, right? Because we have classical waves all over the place and they have superposition. Um, there's also that maybe the power of it comes with no flowing, no deleting. Um, and Peter mentioned uh, yesterday using linear logic to try and capture this distinction between the clonability of classical data and the non clonability of quantum data. But it doesn't give you enough to really talk about quantum mechanics because indeed classical resource logics like linear logic have these things in them as well. So we need something more. And so the extra thing that I wanted to talk about today is the formalization of complementarity. So, in case anyone doesn't remember what this is, if we take a qubit in some arbitrary state, and we can measure its z spin or its x spin, and you have these probabilities for the outcomes. The point is, if I measure, if I happen to already be in an eigenstate of z, which is zero, for probability 1 to see 0 when I measure it, and probability 0 for the other one. But if I measure the x, then I have equal probabilities to see either of them. <coughs> and generally, if I'm already in an eigenstate of x, I have a certain outcome here, an impossible outcome here, and if I measure z instead of my own state, I'll see two equal probable outcomes. And that's what it means for uh, an observable to be complementary to another observable. More generally, I'm going to think of any basis on the space as defining an observable. And it will be called complementary, where for each pair of, of vectors, the inner products here and here will always be equal. Okay, so this is called mutually unbiased basis or complementary observables, depending on if you want to emphasize physics or mathematics. Okay, so what I'm going to introduce now is a formal calculus based on what you can actually say, positive things you can say about complementary observables. What do they let you do? As opposed to oftentimes we talk about quantum theory and all things you can't do. You don't commute operators, you don't distribute open your lattices, you don't observe the state directly, and these kinds of things. So what we're going to do here is show formalism based on things that you can do using complementarity. Okay, so this is a rough outline of what I'm going to talk about. 
since Monday morning seems like a long time ago, I will remember the uh, diagram notation in Bob introduced. And I'll put some extra, some extra things in there we're going to need. I'll talk about the algebraic structure you get from one quantum circle. This will follow on from the Jamie saying that this talk yesterday. I'll oh, use a nice little thing here from today's group which arises when you have this. And then I'll consider what happens when you have two complementary observables and how these two algebras will interact. So that's the kind of high theory part. And now after that we'll do some applications and show how you use this to calculate the quantum circuits, think about the time states, particular graph states, and do some things in measurement based quantum computing. Okay? So diagrams. So here's the basic model of all our diagrams. There'll be some blob in the middle and some input lines and some output lines. Um, and this thing in the middle can be any kind of process that turns inputs into outputs. And in my pictures, I'm usually going to draw time going down the road. So I'm not going to be entirely consistent. With so if we have such things, the main thing we can do with them is um, propose them, right? If I take it, an entire output, I could do another input and make a composite thing. This is composition of arrows in, the, in this category. And if I compose three things, a composition is associative. And so I don't want to write any brackets here, right? I mean, technically, I can associate it either way, but it's strict, so I don't want to say anything. I have identities, which I represent as a line. And whenever I have something after an identity, it's the same thing as having a thing before the identity, which is the same thing as just not having an identity at all. And as well as sequential composition, which is a monoid category, so we have a parallel composition from the tensor problem. And again, it's associative, so I can just write down this diagram and not worry about the brackets. Got strict. So. And as I mentioned by, by Bob in this talk, because we're in this diagrammatic language, we get some equations for free. So this is a, a non trivial equation, interchange of sequential and parallel composition, and it just translates to a single diagram. So you get some equations for free by using citation. And we're actually going to need quite a lot of equations for free. And uh, the identity for, for two things, obviously, just two identities. Okay, so a, a notable thing to, to notice is that if in the previous picture, um, G and H here, if G and H actually have identities, then by the way, actually really want to slide these along the lines, and so it doesn't matter what order they're in. So there's no there's no forced sequence of things which happen in parallel, but they're really in parallel. Okay. So the tensor product has a unit, which is called I, and I can denote it by nothing. And so in diagrammatic language, something with no, nothing coming in and something coming out will be the preparation of a fresh state. A ket, if you want to need that connotation. And something with a line coming in and nothing coming out will be a bra. And if you compose a bar for care, you get the scale. It's crystal to And the scalars are always going to form a commutative model. And you can multiply arrows by scalars as you used to not doing so in the next class. Okay, so I'm not sure if Jamie actually mentioned what a symmetric noise category was, but the idea is that you have lines that they can cross. And I don't care about the equal problem. I'm going to have a following relation where if I cross and I cross again, I will speed that again. And like I can slide the boxes before, I can slide them over the crossings. It doesn't matter. So essentially you can think of these lines as being infinitely stretched. Okay, so that's a symmetric monoidal category. I'm going to now bring a little more structure to make a dagger monoidal. So when I say a dagger, I'm going to have a functor. Say a map on the arrows and on the morphisms as well, so the objects and the morphisms. Whenever I have an arrow f from a to b, I'll have another arrow called f dagger from b to a. And I'm going to denote f dagger by just turning f upside down. And if I allow myself to have this dagger, which you should probably think of as the usual adjoint vector spaces, 
So, yesterday James was talking about jewels. So the kinds of categories, most normal kind of categories have jewels in them, or compact those categories. So it has, each object has a jewel object, which I'm going to call a star, and it's both left and right jewel. And the main properties we have these maps, the D and E, which start from nothing, produce the A star and A, and come from A and A star produce nothing. And if I compose them like this, then I get the idea. So again, my lines are stretchable, bendable, I can do whatever. Now I put all these facts together, I get something which I'm going to call the graphical catalyst theorem, which is about three or four different theorems by different people in different decades. And it just says that whenever I can deform this diagram to something else, then these things are equal by a theory of diagram compact mechanics. Okay, that was the revision. Everything is clear? So what, what can you do with such a thing? Well, a nice example might be on Dagger on category is to write a quantum surface. So I can write down this thing and say, oh yeah, it's a quantum surface. I'm going to give it an input, I'll call this one zero, I'll call this one zero, I'll call this one H for Hadamard, I'll call this one C naught. And well, I'm kind of stuck now. I don't have any more structure, I don't have any more equations to prove it. So this is why I'm going to introduce a bit more. Say that if I have a, a unitary operation for D, I can't duplicate two different quantum states unless they're orthogonal. And likewise, I can't erase two distinct quantum states by mapping them to some constant unless they're orthogonal. And so, so you can understand that one way of saying quantum states can't be copied, but well, the other way you can understand the saying is if I promise you my quantum state is an eigenstate of some observable, I can copy it. And so if I know what, what observable it belongs to, then I can in fact think of it as a classical piece of data. Okay? So we're going to formalize quantum observables in terms of these copying and deleting operations, which uh, appear at the end of James' talk as the uh, Frobenian algebra. So I'll try to be a little more concrete than James was. So here is Copying operation we call it little delta, has one input and has two outputs. Now, a reasonable property you might ask for a copying operation is if you copy something and then you copy the other thing, it should be, shouldn't matter which copy gets copied. So this is called cool, cool associative. If I have my erasing operation here and I copy something and I erase one copy, it should be the same as doing nothing. It doesn't matter which copy gets erased. So that's the four unit clause. And this is going to be commutative. If I copy something, these things are copies of each other. So this shouldn't matter if I swap them over. So it's commutative. Okay. And I'm in a dagger category, so I can take an adjunct of all these things. So instead of having a co-multiplication or a copy or a co-unit or an erasing, I can have a multiplication and a unit. So Copying and the erasing form of cobaloid, and the multiplication of the unit form of. Except for the isometry property, it would give you an orthogonal basis for your space. Adding in the isometry property makes it to an orthonormal basis. So basically, to define delta and epsilon for any any five dimensional Hilbert space, I just pick my preferred orthonormal basis, and then delta is the map that sends each basis vector to two copies of itself. And likewise, epsilon is the one which takes the equal sum. Of all the basic vectors one to 
example which we've probably seen already is the map that takes 0, 0, 0, 1 to 1, 1. And the, the epsilon in this case is, in, is a, a, a plus state but not a minus. Okay, so the, the interesting thing to note here is that this is a copying operation for 0 and 1, but not for anything else. Particularly if I put plus into it, I get a 0, 0, plus 1, 1, which is bell state. Okay, so that picture there is the, uh, what I get from feeding, because this is epsilon here is the plus state up to the normalization factor. So I'm plugging epsilon dagger into delta, I get this little picture. And it turns out this is the bell state, so this is the, the bendy line. So, I mean, the typical method model of the spider theory is we have all this structure, it's kind of boring. Everything just collapses down to just a disparity. So, we can perhaps bring something more interesting into the picture. So, recall that we had a monoid, and the monoid means we have a multiplication. So, I let uh, psi and phi be two points in A, then I can multiply them together using my monoid operation. And I'll call that so this or in pictures like that. These are my two input states, this is the multiplication. And because of the properties I already showed you, we know straight away that it's going to be a commutative monoid, it's going to be associative, and the, the unit of it is going to be the unit of the previous structure. Okay. So a quick example of this, if I take as my delta the, uh, the one which copies the standard basis, so that's the matrix there, and I take two arbitrary points, sine phi, and what I get from that multiplication is just the, uh, 
So what I'm interested in there is we have two complementary classical structures. So for example, one copies the standard basis, and one that copies the uh, plus minus basis. And they'll be co and they're complementary in my definition when I, every point which is copied by green, every is unbiased for red. And Julie, every point which is copied by red is unbiased. So this is the the, uh, the box here with two observables. 
Nor should I like to for two unbiased groups, four classical points. And notice that I think <laughs> down here, pi corresponding to this classical point among unbiased points, I get sigma x. Of course, the sigma x exchanges these two gaps. Right? And here I have the sigma. Yeah, let's see why we're just going to exchange these. And that's again, that's a completely general number. So here's a statement that I follows. Whenever you've got closed classical structures, the following are all equivalent. So the closeness property I just mentioned. In fact, these classical maps will commute with the uh, homoloid. So you can just pass through that dot. You have these commutation relations. So these, these, class, these are both classical. They can commute with each other at a cost of giving up a scalar. In the same way that the, the polys commute up to a, a scalar. And most interestingly, they form a bialgebra. So if I take the co-multiplication of one with the multiplication of the other, I can commute them like this. Now, lots of interesting stuff that follows. So, here I want to just very quickly show you now that these classical maps, these eyes, because of the, of the generalization of polys, are group polymorphisms of this unbiased group. Okay, so here's the element of the group, here's the, uh, here's the, the map that I'm claiming the automorphism. The first thing to show is that, if I, if, that this thing is still an unbiased point. Okay? So I compose it on with this multiplication, and I compose that with adjoint. And can I prove that this is in fact an unbiased point? Well, yes, I can, because this is classical, so it can pass through here by my, by my property I mentioned a minute ago. And this one is also by symmetry, by the, the evaluation. And those are adjuncts, so they cancel. Now, I have a lot of green dots next to each other, including this is known to be unitary, and this is known to be unitary. And they're composed of each other, or whatever. That is going to be the adjunct of that when we the entry. So that can disappear, and the whole thing can be the entry. And so that's not enough to show it's a group of homomorphism, but at least it preserves the proof. And the rest of the proof is just a simple bit of equational reasoning showing that you can uh, preserve, you can compute the multiplication of the unit and so on. Okay, so this is an example of the kind of calculations you can do. Theory. This is more abstract than perhaps the, uh, the uh, concrete quantum computing we want to do there. So the, the moral of the story is that the classical points of your of your observable structure, the eigenvectors of your observable structure, in fact define symmetries of the phase group, of the, the phases, the phase shift from the other one. Okay, so we have so this is Q-trits, I have the, the copies of standard basis, and all the elements in this base group look like that. Here I have the Fourier transform of that, and all the elements in this base group look like that. So, it turns out that these are classical when alpha is one of these things, <coughs> and there is 2 pi minus that. So, here are the here are the classical maps among those groups. You see, again, it's, it's obviously a subgroup, so it's just along the diagonal here, unless you can see here, but again, it's a subgroup. Let's just pick this one and show where its effect is on phase group. So here's an arbitrary point of the unbiased group, and I act on with this thing, this classical map. It's just a, it's a permuting the, uh, the elements like that. In fact, this is the effect. I don't know how to draw this as a picture on Taurus, but that's what it is. So, yeah, that's what I said earlier. So, the point of the phase group is because of this action of, of one structure on the other, this is the source of all kinds of interference phenomena and the underlying arithmetic in theory. Okay, so Bill Edwards will tell you more about his last bullet point. Okay, I think there won't be any more definitions. So that, although I tried to illustrate it with relatively concrete examples, um, that was all very general. I can take this in, in A's 
setting where you have these structures around. But when we go the quantum circuits, we already have a fairly good idea of what these things are going to be. So in particular, I'm going to pick to complement the observables to be the, the X and Z spin observables. And we've already seen that the unbiased group is just the circle, and the classical group is just ST. And so the action of the classical group on the circle is to send each base to its negation. And to make my life a little bit easier, I'm going to demand a final piece of structure, namely Hadamard. So the Hadamard map has a nice property that it's self adjoint and unitary, so it squares the identity, and more importantly, that it exchanges these two bases. So I can use these Hadamard maps to change the color of anything that appears in my pictures. Okay? So now I'm going to work in a category of formal diagrams, which are generated by these elements. So I'm just going to incorporate spider here straight into my notation. So this is the spider with the fine perspective Z, and the spider with the fine perspective S, uh, X, sorry, and had a mark here. And so I'm going to say, let D be the dagger combat category, so monoidal, bendy lines, flipping things, generated by these kind of things. I'm going to ask that whenever I take the dagger or one of these spiders, I send alpha to minus alpha. So alpha here is just a value between 0 and 2 pi. And the semantics of these things can be defined as linear maps. So I, my convention is inputs for the top, outputs for the bottom. So this will be a linear map from m to, uh, uh, from 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert space to 2 to the n dimensional. Yeah, it's based on sending all the, the component, which is all zeros, which is all zeros, the vector, which is all ones, the phase shift of alpha with all ones, and everything else is zero. And this is the same thing, but just transformed by that one. I had one as the usual. Okay? So that's the semantics. Now I'll introduce some equations on these things, formal equations of mechanical diagrams. So these three together formalize the spider rule. So I can merge dots when they come together, I can remove loops, and if I have zero at the angle here, the interpretation of zero is just the identity. So I can simply drop the dot. And the rule says if I have pi, I can commute it with alpha, as I showed as a, as a property earlier. And if I do that, I flip the case. And a bioalgebra rule, the rule that says I can copy this point, and the rule, for, this is the sort of spiderized version of what I talked about, instead of just having one input here, I have all the inputs I need. And I have a lot of let me change the colors, and I say that h squared is the identity. So this is only half of the story, but I want all the same laws again with the two colors reversed. So now we've got this like, represent logic case. So if I do a green dot with an alpha, it's just the z rotation. If I do a red dot with an alpha, it's just the x rotation. And you can check this by calculating if you want to, but this particular picture is a C naught. But you can actually see it abstractly. So I can plug in a red dot here. Now remember this red dot stands for the cubic zero. So this one will be the control input with my C naught. That red dot gets copied, and then by my spider theorem, I can just remove that one. So it's just the identity. So I'm doing, I preserve my control, and I'm doing nothing to my target. And if I pick up the one qubit instead, again I've copied, that's the classical point, but this time instead of being 0, I'm pi, so this is an x. So that's, and in fact, None of that I showed you relied on the fact that this is actually happening for the qubits. This could be completely arbitrary. So here's another nice little example that shows up. This is in fact the whole the example that made us realize that we've had to have a biology right here. So three C naughts. In Gershka's textbook, you know that three C naughts is a swap case. Okay, so to form the diagram a little bit, there's some twists in, push that through. And now you see the picture in the biology room, right? So I'm going to 
CZ is. Let's do a quick elementary proof that two CZs with the identity. So you get a little more flavor of the kind of computation that you can do with. So, does anyone want to guess what the first, uh, the first step of the proof is? Combine the dots. Combine the dots. Yeah. We combine like that. Here's the last circuit example I'm going to do. This is the, the two qubit Fourier transform. So here's the input qubits, here's the control phase gate, and here's two other gates. So again, so we can run the evaluation of this just by doing some nice rewrites. So that one is copied, because it's classical, joins those guys part of the spider law, and down at the bottom. That one changes color. And we just evaluate the bottom in a row here. That one can pass through because it's classical. You can merge with this one. That can go through the pipe, but it changes the space. And they merge. <coughs> and that's the way we transform that bit stream. Right? So, I hope you're convinced that you can represent all quantum circuits in this language, right? I showed you CNOTs, I showed you all the page rotations, that's enough. But an interesting question might be, which of these diagrams are quantum circuits? Because this is a much bigger class of things than just circuits. So this is a, a slightly uh, incomprehensible definition, but it's actually quite comprehensible if you, if you unpack it. So I call a diagram circuit-like if all of its green, red vertices all of its red vertices and all of its endpoints can be covered by a set of disjoint paths, each of which must end in an output. Okay? I'm going to have the uh, explanation says that if there's a cycle in the diagram which touches two paths, it must traverse at least one edge opposite to the direction of the path. This is a causality history. And finally, this is just a technical definition saying it's so I won't have too many um, oil vertices anymore. Okay, so what does that mean? <coughs> so is this diagram circuit like? Yes. So here's here's the short paths, one, two, three, and then here. There is a cycle, but since it doesn't traverse on the stage, it's okay. And in fact, if you think about it, I can use my spider law to actually unpack this thing. To actually unpack this thing, and you can see that this guy, which is clearly a circuit, CZ, C0, and on one side, gives you this diagram by its back. Okay. So, how about this one? Circuit like is a little bit stronger than being unitary embedding because I'm not just saying you have to be unitary embedding. I'm 
I'm saying your inventory vary with respect to the gate set that I chose and with respect to being coded the way that I want to be coded in that gate set and also the smooth validity condition for just for technical reasons. So if you are prepared to accept all that as for free, then it's a bit different.
And so we can prove some other commonness properties of gas states in this language. So here's a fixed point property we mentioned. Uh, so here, I'm always going to use the triangle because it's, it's nice. But if you can do the triangle and the star as induction, you can arrive at all the other graphs. So I have my, my graph here, my pick, particular vertex, and I act on it with an X rotation of pi, and I act on all its neighbors with uh, Z rotation of pi, then these should be equivalent. Can we prove it? Yeah, we can prove it quite easily. So here is the, the, the pi. It's going to be copied by the green dot. Oh, sorry. It's going to be copied by the green dot. It's going to change color as it passes through the anemoids. Down here I have lots of green things next to each other, so they can be spider, but 2 pi is just the same as 0. So that's yeah, and I, I somehow I find this representation of graph states you know, quite um, helpful in explaining where these different stabilizing relationships come from. Okay. So in this language I've got um, X rotations, I've got Z rotations, and I've got the Hadamard gate. Does anyone see the problem? So the main use of graph states, I guess, is for measurement-based quantum computing. So 
let's see what we can do in this setting. So this is a uh, this is a method-based quantum computation but co-selected, right? So down here are measurements, but I'm just taking those projections, right? We can just cats. Uh, here are the pair of qubits, and here are the entangling gates making this together. So I see a lot of green in this picture, so I can just bring that all together using my spider rule. And uh, these ones are just zero, so they can go away. And uh, these can cancel. And I can change the color of this guy because it's surrounded by H's. And those can go away. And so what that's proof of is this program, which I stole from the paper of um, Ben Kashevli and Pan Gandhi. Uh, it proves that this, well, this measurement pattern actually computes an arbitrary one cubic unit tree, and here's this, this direct proof of the solid decomposition. And we can prove many of these things are correct in the same way. So here's a measurement pattern in the syntax of the measurement calculus. So, so n, 3, and 4 are these cubic which Pairs, so one and two are the inputs. I have three entangling gates showing where these H's, and I have two measurements. I'm just going to assume here my measurements come out to be plus. Okay, and so here's the thing called the notes taken away, all the green dots joined together, and then I can just change the color of this one, the red one, and you can see it's the C note. This is nice if you're going to believe in post-selection, but I think you probably actually want to reason a bit about determinism. And as Simon explained just before, the key property you want to think about is this flow property, or the flow or the G flow properties. So this is the, the definition, but I won't actually labor that. But let's just think how you can study these kind of things. So I take some measurement pattern here. Got quite a few cubes in it. I can convert it to a diagram relatively straightforwardly. Then uh, use a spider rule. And so all of these uh, green dots pass into this. Now, what you probably guess already is that this is just the graph of the underlying graph. Screen. And so I can But again, this is a, the results about the flow and the G flow, they simply assert that there exists a deterministic pattern. If I give you a pattern, it doesn't tell you whether that one I gave you is actually deterministic or not. You might have put the corrections in the wrong place or missed all the programming there. So that's a, something we might be able to improve on, in fact, we will be able to improve on. Um, and something else that we delved into a bit during small talk is that if you have think to deterministic, but not uniformly deterministic. And in that case, knowing about the flow or the G-flow won't help you. So, how are we going to represent real measurements in our, in our setting? So, I'm going to assume that I've got some, some measuring device, but I'm just think about how we're going to do this, right? So, it sees, it sees zero, I'll say yay, and it sees one, I'll say boo. But, that could just be the same as seeing one, and then doing x first, and then you say yay. So, I'm going to make, try to arrange it so I only ever have to say yay. Yeah. So, I don't like the negative. So, I can generalize this idea a bit. So, if I've got two of these gadgets, how am I going to measure um, two cubes? Well, how am I going to measure the bell base, for example? Well, obviously, I'm going to do the rotation to construct the bell base in front of it, to destruct the bell base in front of it. And I have them on bell bases. And so, instead of saying boo, I'll just have an X here. The condition on this measurement that I didn't do, and then I can 
Okay, so here's the first element of the database. So the, the point is you want to see the state of here. So if she actually manages to measure the bell, the, the 0011 state, then Bob will see the correct uh, sign. Otherwise, these are the other possible outcomes. But it's not just that she sees the outcome, but also for this protocol to go through correctly, I also need to incorporate the idea that Bob can do something conditional on that outcome. Right? So that's important to the ability to correct anything. And likewise, what I have to say in that and this thing. Okay? So here's the, the, the simplest uh, measurement pattern I could find. This is how to compute a one. So I have one uh, cubit here, a zero measurement here, So you can see straight away that if I get my yeah measurement and project onto plus state, then by the spider law, everything just goes away and it's had enough. But if I say boo, then I have a, a pi here, which means I saw the, the minus state in my measurement. Um, I can still do some things, um, but now when I come to the end, I have to correct this. So again, I need to have some language to let me introduce a correction condition on something happening. Okay, so that's exactly what we're going to do then. So let S be some set of variables, which are called signals, which are just normal variables. And where D was my category diagram before, DS will be the same category, but where each of these red and green vertices is annotated by some set of variables chosen from S. And in fact, in this presentation, these sets S prime will always be singletons to one variable. And now we can use the definition of the, the diagrams without conditions to um, define the semantics of diagrams with conditions. So if I take uh, a valuation name of, of S, namely a function from the set of variables S with 0 and 1, for every valuation you can define uh, a map from which is taking your diagram in DS to diagram in D just by throwing away the variables and changing the angle alpha uh, in such a way that if the product of all the s's that occur at that vertex are zero, then alpha is zero. And if they're one, then it, then it remains alpha. Okay? And then this is a collection of linear maps, and so you can construct now the uh, super operator of the diagram of ds by saying you take it any state uh, row the sum over all valuations of the diagram was. So, a more concrete example, this is in the, the syntax to represent a Z measurement. So I have my projection of the plus state, and I have a base flip, which is conditioned on variable X. X has two possible values, 0 and 1. If it's 0, this is just the identity, if the base goes to 0, and if it's 1, the base state is it's space power. So it's the, the semantics is that the, it's the sum of the row projected onto plus and row projected onto the z x plus, which is just minus. And then all my equation rules I showed you before, I have to modify a bit because I can't just willy nilly go merging things with the condition of different variables. But more or less everything is the same. These have to have the same variables to join, these don't matter. But I have a new rule here saying the green dots can commute with each other if they have different variable, they can't merge. And on the other page, say that in the hot plot, I don't require that these guys have the same variable. The same okay, and once again, everything doubled with red and green exchange. Okay, so now we can translate the measurement calculus syntax into diagrams. So, my new qubit structure is just the green dot. My entangle gate is the CZ, as I already showed you. The measurement of qubit at I with angle alpha is the projection of the minus alpha with uh, the qubit in the index I as a signal for this conditional operation. And then the correction operators are just these um, base gates with S as the signal which turns them on. So here's a C on the example again, where we've all corrections to put in. And so you can see there are, there are now two 
two red ones cancel each other. Now I have here also a green dot, so in my edges, so it becomes red. This one can go through and be, be copied, and these are two exactly the same hybridations, so they cancel, and so it's a C1. Okay, cool. So we've removed all the conditional operations, so not only did we prove that this thing really computes the C0, we also proved that it does so deterministically. There's no non deterministic left in this picture. So can we do it in general? And if the graph has a causal flow, we can. So we give the free write strategy, which explains how to propagate forward the errors. So essentially, what you do is you reduce the circuit to this form, which is closest to its graph state, and then you follow this, this strategy to move the errors forwards in time. Okay. So here's an example. So here's a very simple pattern. It's just the flow is one line up here like this. So these are the, the, uh, the initial qubits. Here's two measurements. Here's a correction, or rather, yeah, kind of a measurement which is conditioned on this measurement, and two corrections here. So, this is already reduced to its circuit like or almost circuit like form, and so this one is now just going to ride along the, uh, the arrows until it gets needs to go. It stays close to here, it will be copied, but that's fine. It's going to cancel with that one. Z, 
you have the CZ operation which is defined with respect to Z, and you have the corrections, the measurements, sorry, which are defined also with respect to Z. So all these things can, can collapse together in this binary model. So that sort of reduces the circuit representation to a more minimal one, which is basically like the graph state itself with a minimum tang of it. But it's also essential in 